<clears throat> All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for the ninth curriculum integration program presented by the Department of English and Humanities at the University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. My name is Dr. Abu Saleh Mahmoud Rafi. I'm really excited to organize this curriculum integration program on behalf of the Department of English and Humanities. The purpose of the curriculum integration program is to give our students an opportunity to, opportunity to generate creative projects that connect their course contents with a real world issue. We choose language weaponization as the theme for this ninth curriculum integration program and titled it as language as a weapon. The concept of language weaponization gained prominence within the fields of military studies and political sciences throughout the early 1900s, serving as a descriptor for control and manipulation of language. It refers to the deliberate use of words, discourse, language in various manifestations to cause harms to uh, individuals and groups. Furthermore, scholarly discourse has explored how language education practices, policies, programs, and curricula can be utilized as a tool to exert control, undermine legitimacy, deny access to resources and opportunities, and marginalize individuals and communities that differ in appearance or behavior from those in positions of power. The weaponization of language can be observed throughout history, starting with the barbaric representation of indigenous peoples from the Caribbean islands and the Americas in the 15th century. The trend continues to present day with instances of anti-Black linguistic racism, anti-Asian discrimination, and physical assaults in the 21st century. As usual, the curriculum integration program includes two forums where two experts in the field will discuss the concepts related to language weaponization. They will familiarize our students with the theme, its scope, and its scale. So today is the first forum focusing on language, linguistics, and language education streams. I would like to thank Professor Luis Javier Penton Herrera, University of Economics and Human Sciences, Poland, for accepting my invitation to speak at today's forum. We are also joined by Professor Kaiser Hamidul Hawk, Dean, School of Arts and Humanities, for delivering the uh, welcome address. Just wondering if Sar is here by now? Probably no. Sar is here. Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, uh, under a different and, name. <laughs> my wife made, this was, you know, fixed, but it has gone back to this. I don't know how, I don't know how to fix it. But welcome, Professor. We can hear you, sir, loud and clear. Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, we can see you. Yes, yes. So, um, we are joined by Professor Kaiser Hamidul Hawk, as I said, uh, Dean School of Arts and Humanities for delivering the welcome address, and Professor Shamshad Mortuza, the Special Advisor to Board of Trustees, University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh, for making the closing remarks. Just a few house rules before I invite Professor Hawk to deliver the welcome address. The event will be recorded and aired live on ULAB's official Facebook page. It will last approximately an hour and 30 minutes. If you have any questions or comments, is Kaiser sir saying something? Okay. Uh, carry on. So I, I think he got disconnected. Okay. okay. So if you have any questions or comments, please join the Zoom, uh, Zoom chat during the presentation. We'll have a 30 minutes networking session at the end during which our speakers, the speaker will respond to your questions from the chat box. So without further ado, I'd like to request Professor Paisar Hamidul Haq, Dean School of Arts and Humanities View Lab to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, sir, if you are still connected. Sorry, I don't see, no, I don't see him. So maybe we can start like in a so and we can. Okay. 
Okay, then we'll we'll move on to Lewis for the forum lecture. All right, uh, wonderful. Uh, before we proceed to the forum speaker, I just like to read his brief bio. Luis Javier Canton Herrera, PhD, a full professor at University of Economics and Human Sciences, Poland, the coordinator of the graduate TESOL certificate at the George Washington University, United States, and co-editor of Tapestry, a multimedia journal for teachers and English learners. In addition, he is a Fulbright specialist and an English language specialist, U.S. Department of States. Previously, he served as the 38th uh, president of Maryland TSL from 2018 to 2019 and earned the rank of sergeant while serving in the United States uh, Marine Corps. Two of his professional accolades includes the uh, include the 30 up and coming emerging leaders in TESOL, awarded by TESOL International Association in 2016, and the J. Steele Alex Alexander Future Leader in Literacy Award, awarded by the Association of Literacy Educator Educators and Researchers, uh, ALER, in 2018, when his dissertation was chosen as ALER's 2018 outside, Outstanding Dissertation of the Year. Kaiser sir is calling me. Just a second, please. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, yes. All right. So Kaiser Sir should be here in a minute, he said. I think we move on. So Dr. Penton Harris cutting current teaching and research projects are situated at the intersection of identity, emotions, and well-being in language and liter literacy education, socio-emotional learning, SEL, autoethnography, and storytelling, and refugee education. His mm -hmm. books can be found in Rutledge, uh, Springer, Brill and Sands, De Greater, Tissel Press, and Roman and Little Field. So over to you, Luis. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for the warm welcome and the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to share the PowerPoint presentation. So just give me one moment, please. All right. All right, so let me know if you can see. We can see, yes, we can see you. Wonderful. All right, so I'm very happy to be here with all of you today to talk a little bit about language as a weapon. And I'll share with you some um, first some details about uh, language weaponization, but I want to start with a story. So just before we get started, something that I do want to share with you. And um, I see that we have 169 participants, which is fantastic. It's 171 now. It's wonderful. So our conversation today can be sensitive for some individuals. So do keep in mind that our conversation in the way that I want to to take us into this conversation is from a scientific perspective, okay? So it's going to be scientific in nature. Um, this means that we're dissecting, we're analyzing how language has been and continues to be used as a weapon against specific populations, specific groups of people um, around the world, okay? And I'll give you different um different examples and, and different uh, conversations. We'll go into different conversations, examples, et cetera, okay? Also throughout the conversation, if I'm speaking too fast or anything, please let me know in the chat box. If I'm, you know, if you want me to go back to this, the, the, the previous slide, because I went too fast, just uh, let's stay in communication here in the chat box, just let me know. So our agenda for today, 
introducing myself and my work. So I'm going to get started with a story as I share with you. Then I'll go into language weaponization and that's going to be um, an introduction of language weaponization from, from my perspective and the work that I've been doing. Then I'm gonna go into dominant and minoritized groups. I'm going to explain to you what that is and how they go or they, um, the kind of how they uh, uh, behave in, in, in this uh, construct or concept of language weaponization. And then I'll give you some examples at the end, depending on how much time we have, I'll go deeper into the examples or not, but then we'll go into Q and A's, questions and answers. All right, so this is going to be our conversation today. Before we get started, I'm going to ask you, and I actually have to minimize this, just one moment. Oops, sorry, sorry. I'll go back one moment, one moment. Let me minimize because I have to show you, I have to give you the, okay, one moment. I'll give you the link. And I'm going to ask you in this link that I'm sharing with you here in the chat box, if you could please share with me one to two words to describe your feelings or ideas that come to your mind when you hear the phrase language as weapon. What do you see? What do you visualize? What do you feel when you hear language as weapon? Okay, so you can just click on the um, on the, the link that I shared there with you, and then you can add it. You can add your response. Again, one, maybe two words, and then we're going to see Ah, oh, we already have a response. Okay, let me stop sharing and I'm gonna share now the word cloud. So we're going to start seeing a word cloud and they're coming very, very fast now, the responses, so thank you. Dominance, power, happy and sad. Mm, interesting, happy and sad. What is the cloud? Well, <laughs> that's a different, yeah, that's a different question, but thank you, thank you for adding that. The sun, language to hurt others. Power stays there in the center, so it seems that it's 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 getting bigger because more people I think they're they're writing power power propaganda absolutely um, meaningful messages yes so we we have about nineteen responses right now we're gonna get more and more but you see we're already when we think of the word or the phrase language as power we are already associating some words oppression invasion freedom or lack of freedom, right, also. Um, so we already understand, even if we haven't heard uh, the presentation about language as weapon, we already understand that when we talk about weapon and weaponizing something, there is some elements of power connected to it, right? And from my perspective, I've always seen language as perhaps one of the most, people think of, of power being like money and this and that, but I've always seen language to be the most powerful, um, if, if not the most, one of the most powerful elements in our society, global society. And um, we're seeing there after 42 responses that power and freedom seem to be the biggest, um, the most common responses, which is very interesting. So I'll leave that there for now. You please continue to respond and then we'll come back to the word cloud, okay? But let me go back now into the PowerPoint, and then we'll get started, okay? So thank you so much. Continue, continue with your responses that we'll come back to the work cloud later. All right, so let me share my story with you. And um, I have, I, I wrote it down, this particular uh, story, I wrote it down so I can be a little bit more uh, concise, but also more, um, more eloquent as I go through my story. And uh, so thank you so much for your patience as I read through this, okay? For as long as I can remember, language has been an important part of my life. My earliest memories with language are often connected to the words pato and maricón. We have the two the two top words on the on the uh, left and, and right hand side. These two uh, words are pejorative terms often used in Cuba to refer to individuals who are part of the lesbian, gay bisexual, transgender, and queer community, LGBTQ. Classmates in my elementary school and all the children in the community will often yell these words at me. As a child, I did not fully understand what these words meant or the meaning that they carried, but I recognized the hostility connected to these two words 
when all the children will use them to describe me. Eventually, when some of my friends, especially male friends, male uh, boyfriends, right? Uh, male uh, friends who were boys or males, uh, stopped talking and interacting with me for what I assume was fear of also being called these words, I understood that the power um, the, the power that language has uh, is significant when it comes to influencing people's actions and can affect either positively or negatively the life of other people. At those early years of my life, I became increasingly aware of how language can be used systematically to stigmatize, segregate, dehumanize, and harm others. Even though my elementary school age brain, and when I say elementary is first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, right? During those years, my brain as an elementary school child did not fully comprehend what these words meant, but I quickly became aware that they were not positive because they prompted many of my classmates and friends to stop associating with me, resulting in stigmatization and segregation from my peers. In the following years of my adolescent life, I noticed how these two descriptors, these two words, seem to be insufficient for some classmates and, and people in the community, especially males, um, who would sometimes use more elaborate slurs, such as, and then you, you have the other slurs in there, um, the other four. And uh, through, continuous, through the continuous use of this, all of these pejorative terms, I began to realize that my name, Luis Javier or Luis, was less commonly used by those classmates and people in the community. By continuously using slurs towards me, they began to solidify a culture of dehumanization. I believe that they stopped calling me by my name because calling me Luis Javier would mean that they had to accept my humanity, my state of being human like them and deserving the same respect as them. Now, slurs, when we think of pejorative slurs and the use of language with vulnerization, um, this is usually the first step of uh, the process of language weaponization towards harm. Uh, eventually, as it was in my case, slurs became insufficient. The uh, people saying words or, or uh, expressing words towards me, th those slurs became insufficient for some of them and they began to engage in physical and verbal activities that led to the harming of my physical and mental self. And I began this presentation with this story, with my story, because I want to disclose to you my relationship with and understanding of the concept of language weaponization. So throughout our conversation today, everything I'm going to talk to you about comes from this story and my experiences growing up in Cuba and um, experiencing this concept of language weaponization through my whole life, not only in Cuba, but then also when I moved to the United States when I was 17, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is um, a lot of information that I'm going to share with you here today, but this is my perspective and this is where I'm coming from. So hopefully this will give you a better overview. But, you know, as we say in life, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So all of these experiences, they actually fueled my motivation. And I always say experiences fuel motivation if you if you allow it, if you let it. So I started uh, internalizing a little bit more and try to understand the process of how language has been used and continues to be used uh, not only against me, but all, against other people. And then that's when I started looking into more in detail into the concept of language weaponization in society, in education. And the result was a special issue and I'll be glad to share the links with, with all of you in 2022. And in this, this year, um, we finalized this edited book, The Weaponizing of Language in the Classroom and Beyond. And actually, Dr. Rafi has a chapter in this book, so I recommend it. Check it out and uh, ask Dr. Rafi for, for more details about that. He has the information. All right. So let's go into the definition of language weaponization. And this is now, I'm, I'm going to share with you information that from those two, the special issue and the first edited book, I'm working now on, a, on another book that hopefully is gonna come out soon, I hope, 
Um, but this is information that I'm sharing with you about that book and how I'm taking the process of language weaponization. I'm conceptualizing the process of language weaponization and um, I'm providing you definitions and information from that book that is going hopefully to come out next year. So I understand and describe language weaponization as the gradual political process in which dominant groups use words, discourse, and language in any form to inflict harm on minoritized groups. Okay, two important words here, gradual. The word gradual, for me, it means that it's a process that is going to continue going. Language weaponization doesn't happen one time, someone calls you a name and that's it. No, there is a purpose behind it. When individuals start using words, slurs to dehumanize, to uh, segregate, to discriminate, that's not going to stop. It's going to become bigger and bigger and bigger. It's gradual. And I have seen it throughout history. I have done a lot of historic uh, research and that's usually how it happens. The, the use of language, it's only the first step. And then I also use political because political, it's uh, from, from my perspective, it means that when people use language, they use it, they create that, um, they use that particular word or slur, they use it with an intention. They, they have the choice of using it or not, but when they use it, they make the choice of using that, that, that word, that slur to create power imbalances. Because when you tell someone a slur or a term that is going to make them feel bad, you're creating, you're giving yourself a little bit more power and depowering the other person in your mind, right? So this is why I call it political, because there is this perspective of when people use language, there is always an intention behind using language. And um, this is something that perhaps we can think about in your own context, but I always, 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 and this might be good or bad, but I always analyze when, when I'm talking to people, I analyze the vocabulary that they use, the words that they use, and why, why do they use it that way? So I guess we can call it, and if you're interested in, in probably uh, you've heard of this before, but it's it might be called also discourse analysis. I'm always analyzing what people say and how they say it and the words that they say. Now, when we think about language weaponization, and I wrote it in the chat box, by the way, uh, discourse analysis. But um, when we think of language weaponization, there are two particular um, two particular populations, I call it, right, or groups. And there is the dominant group and the minoritized group. Not minorities, but minoritized. And I'll explain that now. So just to give you a moment here to look at this, but dominant groups, and I put it here in red so you can see it, different from common belief, the word dominant is not synonymous, is not the same as the word majority. Individuals who might be considered dominant groups, and I'm going to show you now who they are, I'll give you examples, but individuals who might be considered dominant uh, in a specific community, specific population, specific society, they might not be the majority. So it's not the same, right? But when we think about dominant groups, there are individuals uh, who possess, who have specific characteristics that indicate their status as dominant group dwellers, meaning as individuals who belong or who are part of the dominant groups. For example, um, when, when we think about of, and this is something important to consider when we think about a society who's considered to be normal in that society. And, you know, some people might not like that terminology, but usually dominant groups uh, and individuals who belong to the dominant groups, they tend to be the people who are normal. And then everybody else has to be uh, or it's, it's either compared to that to those people or other people want to be like them because they, they have qualities that are considered good and, and powerful in that society. I'll give you some examples. Okay, I'm just kind of introducing them right now, but I'll give you some examples. Now, when we think about dominant groups, and I've, I've been looking at uh, these three elements specifically for dominant and minoritized groups, but um, there are three elements that I think are very important to consider when we talk about language weaponization. Dominant groups 
are people who use language to increase their power in society, right? And because of that, they usually use language very strategically because they know that the, the way that they use language, and it, again, it could be in any way, they could use language in social media, in propaganda, TV, talking to people, language, it could be visual language, you know, meaning um, caricatures, a language in any form, anyway, body language in any form, right? So when we think of language and the words that they use, um, usually they tend to be very aware of how their the words can affect the emotions of minoritized individuals and people who are also part of the dominant group. So they're very aware of their emotions and the emotions, of how they, they know how to use language to convey an emotional message. So they're very aware of the connection between emotion and language. Also, it's not uncommon for individuals who are considered dominant or individuals who are considered to be you know, powerful in societies to sacrifice some elements of their identity. And I'll give you an example. In the US, for example, we have what we call the unhyphenated whites. And this is a study that came out a few years ago, many years ago, actually. I'm thinking like in the 80s, 90s, something like that. But um, because typically in the United States, again, and it's not in every society, but it is true in the United States, white, heterosexual, Christian men tend to be the dominant group of that particular society because they have all the elements that are considered powerful. They're white, they're males, they're heterosexual, and they're Christian. So those four elements in the American society is what gives you power. And they have all four, right? So they tend to um, sacrifice parts of their identity, meaning, for example, because white, it's, it's very diverse, you know, even though in the United States, we don't consider that, but we have white people from Ireland, from Italy, from Spain, from Portugal, you know, from Europe but different, different countries, they speak different languages. However, in the United States, many white uh, Americans, they won't tell you usually where they're from or where their family's from. They would just say, I'm American. And that's it. They don't want to hyphenate themselves. Whereas individuals like me or other migrants, for example, we might say, I'm Cuban American. Um, and people will say, I'm Asian American. I'm Latin American, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. African American, et cetera, you know, but people uh, in power tend to sacrifice part of their identity and just connect to the powerful element. In the case of the United States, they would say, I'm white. I'm American. I'm white. That's it. They wouldn't hyphenate themselves. Vulnerability. Um, also, vulnerability, I, I found it very interesting because um, in the particular concept of vulnerability, we look at, oh, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Not, not sure what happened there. Let me go back. Okay, so vulnerability, when we think about um, from the perspective of dominant groups, they do not think of vulnerability as something that is created by nature, but something something that can be constructed by them, meaning that people in minoritized groups are made vulnerable by people in positions of power, in the in this case, dominant groups. So they can create the conditions to make specific groups of society vulnerable. So it's something that they can control. So they can use language to control how some populations can be made vulnerable. Or they become vulnerabilized, right? They become, they, they're made vulnerable because of policies, language, et cetera, that happens in society. Now, I share with you a little bit of information about dominant groups, and I'll be asking you questions as we go through the conversation, okay? But I, I share with you a little bit of information about dominant groups and minoritized groups, right? So some groups, they use language to increase their power because they know they have elements or characteristics that make them powerful in their society. In other groups, as the result, if you're not part of the dominant group, you're part of the other group, which is the minoritized group. It's one or the other. That's how it works in societies, right? But I want to ask you, who might be considered an individual from the dominant group in your context? If you could please share in the chat box, for example, I share with you in the US, someone who would definitely be part of a dominant group. It would be a, a white man. Uh, oh, sorry, 
let me white heterosexual who is Christian US. Okay, so I'm writing here in the chat box. For example, a white heterosexual man who is Christian uh, that will be considered uh, in the US, it will be considered part of the dominant group, right? So in your context, um, in, in your particular society, who would be considered a person who is uh, dominant? A dominant. Uh, we have here educated male. Thank you very much. So an educated educated male will be part of uh, the dominant group, right? Politicians. Yeah, well, yeah politicians. <laughs> Wealthy. So money, education. We have cisgender, heterosexual, middle-aged men. So we're seeing uh, Muslim, thank you, thank you. So we're seeing religion. So some points that I want to see from you, all right? So we're, we're talking about uh, religion, gender, money, right? So so economy, economics, social money, rich, privileged, educated male, Muslim, educated male. So we're seeing already some patterns, right? Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So you're seeing already some elements that contribute to society in your particular context, which is not going to be the same for all societies, right? Every single society is different. Um, so something that I'm not seeing here that you would definitely see in the U.S. is race. I'm not seeing race too much here. But in, in other countries, race might be important for you to be considered a dominant or minoritized, right? So um, now let's go and, and I'll give you some examples. Thank you so much for that. Please continue, continue writing in the chat box, but I'll give you some examples now. We're going to go through minoritized and then I'll give you some examples of some elements that contribute to a person being considered dominant or minoritized in this process of language weaponization, okay? So the term minoritized, usually in the context of language weaponization, we prefer to use minoritized instead of minority because uh, people who are minoritized groups, they're not necessarily minorities in society. They actually tend to be majorities in some contexts, right? Not always, but in some contexts, Minoritized individuals, minoritized groups tend to be the majority of the society in some places, not always. Uh, but, you know, in this case of minoritized, we're saying that they're made, they're turned into a minority um, because of those impositions of power, right? So people, when they use language, dominant groups, when they use language against other groups, then the other groups be become minoritized, right? So minoritized individuals, uh, there are individuals who are outside of the dominant group circle. So in society, you're one or the other. You're either part of the dominant group or you're outside of it in the context of language weaponization. So by design, being a member of a minoritized group means that the minoritized individual are subordinate in terms of power and privilege to the dominant groups. And they have significantly less control or power over their lives. And usually they have fewer opportunities as well. It's just the way that it works in societies. And that's how language is used to give some people more, more power over others. I'll give you some examples. But again, I'm just introducing you to both. Okay. So in these three elements, again, when we think about emotions, identity, and vulnerabilities, um, usually minoritized individuals different from dominant groups. Dominant groups, individuals who use language from dominant groups, they know how to use language to connect it to emotions. They know that the words that they say and how they use it could become something to inflict harm on people. Minoritized groups, they're usually affected by the use of language. And they usually are subjected, they're usually experience language in a way that is derogatory, racist, hateful. And so they usually affect their, their, their emotions. It could cause, it could also cause uh, psychological, uh, um, you know, long-term psychological effects on the person because of the language that they're exposed to, right? Um, it affects their self-confidence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when we think of identity, um, you know, we, we, again, we, we talked about dominant groups wanting to associate, they, they sacrifice part of, of their identity to be part of the dominant group. That's that's what they want to be represented as, right? But then when we think about the identity of minoritized individuals, language has a severe, severe effect 
on minoritized individuals identity because usually they see because of of the language and language again it could be anything it could be advertisements it could be you know think about anything that we see in society the way that communication is language so language is everywhere so usually language promotes this um this social norm and the norm the expectations of the norms are usually connected to dominant groups expectations or dominant groups qualities so when it comes to minoritized groups they usually feel they're represented either negatively or they see themselves as not the norm so they're always struggling with their own identity because they always see themselves as devalued and and they see themselves as less than so they they have conflicts of themselves they feel ina inadequate they feel they might feel like you know self doubts they don't feel confident all of these things because of the language that they're exposed to on a daily basis that is telling them that they're not good enough or that they might not have the requirements sufficient requirements to be considered powerful or the norm in society and last but not least we have vulnerabilities and minoritized groups when we think of vulnerabilities um they're usually and this is something that I explain with dominant groups, they're usually made vulnerable by language in society. The way that dominant groups use language made, uh, makes people in minoritized groups vulnerable. So it's something, vulnerability is a control situation that results as the use of language is weaponized against those people who are considered less powerful in society. And this is how I conceptualize or see the, the perspective of language weaponization be between these two groups. Now, um, another uh, quick stop here. Who might be considered an individual from the minoritized group in your context? And then I, I give you a couple of examples here. I gave person, minoritized religious groups, et cetera. Who is considered, so we talked about dominant groups, but um, who might be considered an individual from a minoritized? Oh, thank you. So non-Muslim, atheist, LGBTQ people. So you see, we're already seeing some elements, right? So religion, uh, sexual orientation. We saw pretty much if you're not in the dominant group, everything else that, that you mentioned, dominant group, if you're not in that group, you're automatically part of the, the minoritized group. That's how it works in, um, in societies when it comes to language, right? Lower class, poor, non-Muslim females, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah, so Fatima, thank you for that. Yes, not vocalizing their opinion. That comes from language weaponization. So usually people in, in minoritized groups, they have less opportunities to, to vocalize their, their opinion or they're not given enough opportunities to share their, their opinions, right? Excellent. Thank you. So I think this actually takes us ethnic groups, lower class, et cetera, et cetera. Sex workers. Yes, absolutely. So look, here we have, and this is actually everything that you have been saying, it goes into this, right? So what are some attributes cont uh, contributing to social placement in this hierarchy of dominant and minoritized? It's going to be different in every society, right? In some societies, Disability is a big thing. And I didn't see anything in disabilities here in your comments. So I don't know if disability is a big thing in Bangladesh. So think about that as well. But disabilities and att attributes, you know, mental and physical disabilities, would that put someone at a dominant or minoritized group, right? Colors in your bodies, you know, in your body, your skin color, your shape, your texture, your appearance, right? So that will be part of disability and attributes. Gender, gender is very complex, but I did see some elements here of gender. So gender expression, gender identity, gender con conforming or non-conforming, right? Oh, a great, great comment here about uh, less beautiful women. So, you know, the beauty standards also could be um, in, in this idea of appearance, right? It goes into attributes of appearance, right? What is considered beautiful or not. Language and expression, you know, your native languages, your verbal expression, nonverbal expression too, that's also very important. If you're mono or multilingual, that also affects your age. I didn't see a lot of age. Well, actually, someone said uh, middle-aged men, um, males in uh, dominant groups. So age could be positive or negative also, right? Social class, we, I, I saw a lot of um, 
you know, income, money, et cetera, et cetera, education, affiliations. You definitely you mentioned affiliations as well, religion, et cetera. Political, yes, absolutely. Sexuality, sexual orientation, which is different from gender. Okay. So sexual sexual orientation, sexual behavior and attitudes, sexual activities, um, origin, you know, citizenship status, national origin. So think about all of these things, right? All of these elements contribute to whether you're placed at a dominant group or a minoritized group. And this is something that perhaps you don't see it word by word in somewhere in society, but it's something that in society, you're always exposed to that vocabulary. You're always exposed to that language. You see it in advertisements, you see it in, in schools, you see it in, it's everywhere, not only in your context, but around the world. And that's how dominant groups use language to promote specific elements that they have and they feel are more powerful than others, right? So how do you, now that I introduced to you the, the concept here of language weaponization and the individuals who are part of the process of language weaponization, which is um, minoritized and dominant groups, I'm going to walk you through a three-step process. And this is something that I conceptualize from, again, my own experience, my own research. Three phases of language weaponization. How do you weaponize language, right? This is how I, I've, I've seen again and again um, how people from around the world, different religions, different political affiliations, different uh, countries around the world, dictators, not dictators, how people use language in a form that is weaponized, right? Three steps. Number one, stigmatize and othering. Number two, dehumanize. Number three, harm. And this is why I said that language weaponization is always cyclical. Is If you start with stigmatizing and othering, it's going to continue to escalate. It's never going to stop in phase one. Once you start phase one, that gives you the motivation as a, as a dominant group person. Uh, you know, if, if you're already stigmatizing people, you're going to continue going further because then phase one becomes natural to you. And then you continue moving to the next phase and the next phase. So that's why language weaponization is a gradual process. So phase one, let me give you a moment to read this while I drink some water. One moment, please. All right, I'm back. <laughs> so um, during the phase one, the, the purpose is to use language to stigmatize and other. The, the concept of othering is to make other people, um, to discriminate against other people or separate them from the dominant or powerful people in society, right? So during this first uh, phase, individuals who control language, who control power, dominant groups, they start assigning labels to specific populations who are considered minoritized, right? And usually, and think about in, in, in your native languages and the languages that you speak, when you think about labels, negative, pejorative labels, they're usually connected to something negative, something inferior, something unclean, something undesired, something subhuman, something connected to animals or infectious diseases. Usually when we were discriminated against specific people, the words, the pejorative labels that dominant group people use, it's usually connected. It's usually in one of those seven categories, right? And through this process of stigmatizing, there is a clear separation because then there is the clear separation be between dominant uh, group members and minoritized because dominant group members, they start using language to label other people. Usually people from dominant groups, they don't get labeled. Now, once you start with phase one, you, you assign a label to someone, then phase two is the concept of dehumanization. So now that you assign someone a label and you can call that person that as a dominant group or, you know, uh, dweller, then you continue to use that phrase again or that label again and again and again, slurs, you know, stereotypes, pejorative language, however you want to call it. 
and you use it many, many times. And the more that you use it, you start solidifying this idea that those people are not human or those people are less than human or those people are unclean or are sinful or are this or are that. There are many ways on how around the world people have been categorized, right? Uh, or they're, they're brutes, they're animals, they're this, they're that, you know, you have probably heard many words like that. So through this process of dehumanization, then people controlling power, they become desensitized, meaning they don't care anymore about the humanity of those people, because they start using those lures so many times that they start feeling a sense of indifference, of apathy, of disgust, of denial, and they just really feel like they don't want to be with those people anymore, right? And this is interesting to see how language affects the way that we think as well. And last but not least, the last process of language weaponization, it's always harm. In many ways, in many shapes, many forms, it doesn't have to be only physical. But you know, now that people were, usually minoritized individuals were stigmatized, they were dehumanized, then the third and es the last escalation of language weaponization is to harm those people who have been made vulnerable in this process of using language, right? And usually there are many ways on how to cause harm. It could be physical harm, which is the most common one, but it's not the only one. Uh, there is emotional harm, psychological harm, financial, political, religious, educational, intellectual. There's so many types of harm right? But that's the purpose of language weaponization when the dominant groups, they start using in phase one. And this is something that I continue to see everywhere around the world. When you start with phase one, it starts escalating. You see the escalation of language and the escalation of humans' uh, actions towards harm. It's always like that. Um, but throughout this final phase of the process of language weaponization, dominant groups motivated by this strong conviction of their superiority. They feel superior, they feel morally correct, they feel powerful. They use force, violence, and any means necessary to erase the presence of minoritized groups. And to erase the presence could be in any way, any form. It could be erase the identity, erase the race, erase the languages, erase the wealth, the faith, the existence by killing them, you know, so there are many ways on how to, when we say erase the presence, you know, they take action to erase those people who are considered minoritized. So this is how kind of a, a visual uh, representation of language weaponization in three phases, stigmatizing others, you start separating dominant groups from minoritized groups, dehumanize, you start using labels, slurs to, uh, start uh, dehumanizing those individuals in minoritized groups and this, the third step, harming. You start erasing them, however those actions might be. Okay, and I'm looking at the time. So I have about 10 more minutes. Um, yes. So let me go. Yes, okay, good, good. So yeah. um, thank you, thank you. I'll go through this for, let's say like about two minutes or so, uh, this example. So I have four examples that I'm going to give you and then we'll open for Q and A's and I can go uh, you know, deeper later if you have any questions about these examples. But um, the first example that I want to give you, it's example of uh, language weaponization in education. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but let me give you a quick background. So in the Americas, uh, North, Central, and South America, the other side of the world, when um, especially Spanish and Portuguese, when they colonized the Americas, they used language. Uh, at that time, Catholicism had a lot of power in Europe, and especially uh, language weaponization was actually influenced by the, the kings and queens, uh, and but also by the, the Catholic uh, faith. And then they started using words against indigenous people, calling them savages. Uh, this kind of words that I described to you in the process of language weaponization. And then they started stigmatizing and dehumanizing indigenous people in the Americas. And then uh, when it, we think about education, they actually started implementing what we call boarding schools. I'll write it down here in the chat box. There is a lot to read about that. 
um, boarding schools and you can in Indian boarding schools because they used to call them uh, indigenous people they used to call them Indian um, there's a story behind that too but I won't go into that one today so Indian boarding schools in the Americas and then they created these schools, these Catholic schools, as you can see here, nuns, and they they tried to erase the identity of in the languages of indigenous children. And this is harm number three, erasing parts of, of erasing either the people or parts of their identity, languages, etc. And thousands and thousands and thousands of children were killed in these Indian boarding schools, unfortunately. Uh, because it, they were actually tortured every time they spoke their native languages. They were considered unclean, those languages, because they were indigenous languages. They were considered unclean. They were considered sinful languages. So they would get uh, tortured. And many children were actually killed in this um, in these schools. To this day, the Americas are still actually dealing with a lot of trauma from these experiences. It's intergenerational trauma you know, grandparents, great grandparents, and their stories continue to be part of, of their their legacy. Many indigenous people actually lost their languages, their cultures. It was a very traumatic process for the Americas. We're still processing that. LGBTQ um, and, and language weaponization, and this actually comes from Cuba. Cuba in 1959, and this not many people know about this, but when Fidel Castro took over, he actually created a, uh, they had a concentration camp in Cuba against LGBTQ people. And um, you could see through this, this is actually something I'm writing about right now. But uh, in my research, I have found how, especially Fidel Castro, he started stigmatizing and dehumanizing individuals who were part of the LGBTQ community and also people who were against the regime at that time. And they, he created concentration camps against them. And it was uh, eventually many people died here. Many people were tortured. But you could see through his discourse and through his speeches how he started dehumanizing those people, calling them all oh, those those people or people who are not like us and he started separating them so this is an example of how you can see language organization against lgbtq people um and of course there are many many other examples but i'm going through through some of them another example that i can give you here especially in the context of the hidden curriculum in education in the textbooks specifically uh this is some work that i've been doing recently um, in the textbooks, even though we might not notice this, but in many societies, we see textbooks that have specific gender roles on how to, uh, you know, for example, boys fix things, girls need uh, things fixed. And we see from early on that textbooks in schools start assigning genders to, and, and you know, women or girls, they, they need to do this or they need help with this. Whereas children, uh, boys specifically, they can do this, they can do that. And there's a lot of research out there that uh, actually starts, and there is actually a lot of tech talks as well. So check it out. But there is some some research that actually confirms that the, the stereotypic, um, st stereotyping gender roles from early in society saying like men can fix things, girls are helpless or they need help fixing. This actually creates a sense of uh, men tend to be more confident and women tend to be less confident in, so in some societies because of gender roles like this that are continuously propagated, again, through language in textbooks, right? And you can see here some examples in the textbook uh, on the left hand side or the bottom, you see, for example, males or boys would talk about specific like technology, cars, airplanes, and women tend to talk more about heartbreak and food and fashion and things like that. And those are, again, think about the textbooks that you have been exposed to and whether or not they um, they actually use language to perpetuate stereotype um, gender roles. Uh, last but not least here, and last but not least, and this is important, especially if you want to become an, an English teacher, but uh, for English teachers around the world, there has been this idea of native and non-native um, accents, native speakers, non-native speakers in the context of um, English teaching. And um, there is this idea of inferior English and how Englishes have been weaponized, how 
you know, if you have a passport from a specific country and you were born in a specific country, you usually have more opportunities. And you see this in job advertisements like this one, teaching jobs in China, English teacher applied now. The only requirement that you need is a native English speaker. So be native, any bachelor's degree, because it doesn't say bachelor's degree in, in ESO and preferred TESOL experience, but you don't have to have it, right? So here, it doesn't matter if you're from another country and you're not a native English speaker, as long as you're a native speaker, you know, that's what they're looking for. And we're seeing this, and I know Dr. Rafi knows about this, we talk about it in the field a lot, but it's this idea of how um, corporations, people who are in positions of power to hire others, they don't sometimes look at the qualifications, they just look at what is considered, again, going back to that image that I show you, you know, nationality, they look at that specific passport that you have, were you born here? Yes, you're a native speaker, we want you, it doesn't matter if you do not have, um, you know, the, the qualifications to be an English teacher. So they're giving hierarchies to specific Englishes, just by geographic location. And of course, that causes harm at the long run, because then teachers who prepare to become English teachers in the long run, because they're not native English speakers, then they, they get harm in the form of economic harm. They do not get more opportunities. So they become minoritized in this perspective. So they have fewer opportunities th than those in positions of power, which in this case will be individuals who are native speakers. Unfortunately, we continue to see this a lot in our fields. And I think I finished right there. So I want to thank you so much. And um, I'm very, very... Um, uh, looking forward and interested in, in, in uh, listening to your question and answers. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for such a thought-provoking lecture. I myself benefited greatly from the uh, framework of language weaponization you presented here, and I believe our students will as well. Uh, since Kaiser Sar is here, um, I would like to invite him to say a few words about the discussion on language weaponization before we begin the Q&A session. Uh, Professor Kaiser Hawk, Dean School of Arts and Humanities, Universities and Social Sciences. Yeah. Uh, right. The video is not... Ah, yes. Uh, am I visible and audible? Yes, well, it should have taken place right at the start. Um, it was my very pleasant duty to, as Dean of uh, Arts and Humanities, to welcome the speaker, Professor Herrera. And uh, I have been able to listen to most of what you've said and enjoyed it very much. Um, I wish to thank you for taking the trouble of uh, visiting us virtually and sharing your uh, ideas about language weaponization. Um, I like the way you um, began from your personal experience and moved on to you know, discuss the role of uh, weaponization in society. Um, I'd like to add, uh, if I may, that um, the point where you stop is where one can go further because I think uh, um, global power relations are very important. The geopolitics, I think, is probably the most uh, powerful uh, factor in, in you know in, in impacting on our lives. And you, it's not only uh, within a society that we see the phenomena that you have uh, you know outlined, but also between countries between civilizations. I mean, not all that long ago, the um, EU um, foreign affairs uh, in charge, I think uh, Mr. Borrell, famously or infamously compared Europe to a garden and the rest of the world to a jungle. <laughs> and and not, did not stop there, but said that Europe has to go out to tame the jungle which is something which is a recycling of what the uh, imperialists of the 19th century were saying. So, I mean, uh, 
you see, uh, we can't it, it stop anywhere when it comes to language because um, every aspect of life, every aspect of society, the globe, you know, um, is affected by language. And uh, we have to be um, very sensitive to the way we use it. And I'm, glad, I'm, I'm grateful to you for um, analytically, you know, showing the audience here how um, language use yeah, is related to um, the exercise of power in our daily lives, in our social lives. And I'm sure the students um, have, um, will come up with uh, very interesting projects um, in uh, light of your discussion and um, in relation to their uh, curriculum. Um, well, I'll end here. Thank you very much again. And I hope uh, there will be more discussions. Another thing that I'd like to add, if I may, is that the, the discussion today has been on the a negative side of language weaponization. And because the, uh, the minoritized can also use language to fight back, like Caliban, you know, famously using language to curse. And um, language um, is used by poets, for example, to to you know to fight back. Um, so there's a lot of um, um, writing in this country uh, inspired by the War of Independence, where you f find poets you know, um, r r trying to use their uh, poetic skills in the service of you know what the independence that we were fighting for. And similarly, I mean, the whole, whole of uh, protest literature and, you know, um, you know, socially conscious literature, you know, again, shows how, like, uh, you know, why the, uh, as it, it was said famous, famously uh, by uh, Balwa Lytton in 1839, the, the pen is mightier than the sword. So uh, it can be used for uh, in the service of uh, good ideas as well. Uh, well I'll, I'll end with that, and I hope the Q and A goes, um, you know, excitingly. <laughs> Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you very much, Professor Ha, for your insightful commentary. Uh, now I'd like to invite questions from the audience. Is there any question? You can also write your questions down in the chat box. So yes, Arafat has already posted one. Okay. Uh, so there's a question in the chat box. How can I, as an individual, make others around me aware of the harm they're causing to the minorities by using certain languages and actions? That's a great question. Thank you so much for that question. You know, um, for dominant groups, and I'm, I'm thinking about um, this perspective, right, of dominant minoritized groups, uh, dominant groups, and I'm trying to remember the name of the publication now, but there was this publication that talked about the process of how dominant groups relinquish power, linguistic power, that is, right? They become more aware of um, how their actions and their words affect those in the in the opposite end, which is minoritized individuals. But it has to be something that dominant groups want to do. So they have to be motivated or they, they, they want to be, um, they should be able to, to feel ready to go through that journey because it's gonna be a, a for, for dominant groups, they consider it to be a difficult journey, uh, you know, they're really, relinquishing power so they go through this grief of losing um and we see always when dominant groups start lose or individuals in dominant uh, positions they start losing power then they they start feeling victims and they start feeling you know all of those emotions are connected to grief because they're losing something they're losing power they're losing cred credibility they're losing who you know that position of the norm you know the people who are everyone is looking up to always and trying to following uh, you know following them or 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 all of these things right um so 
more than anything, of course, individuals from minoritized groups, what we can do is usually, you know, we, we whether um, Professor Hack was talking about this protest and things like this, that, that would be one way to do it. It could be also through, um, I always see writing as an act of advocacy. So for me, the biggest thing, it's always writing and that's what I do the most, right? So it could be depending on your context, depending on the people that you're communicating with, um, that will be, you know, what you can do. It's, I have seen some people who give workshops in the United States, you know, to individuals who might be considered dominant group uh, members, right? So workshops, uh, writing, um, they're, they're different forms of uh, just having casual conversations. But at the end of the day, it's really going to go down to whether or not those individuals are ready to understand and ready to make a change. So if they're not willing to, then it's going to be very hard to convince them. And more and more, I'm, I'm seeing there is more polarization in today's world, you know, where you're from one side or the other side. So people usually tend to be either, um, it, it's very difficult to talk to people because they're not open to listening to other people, which is, it takes me to another topic, but you know, um, so pretty much looking in your context, what is it that you can do? Is it workshops? Is it writing? Is it uh, social acts like protests or, or you know, um, like at the university level, some students, sometimes they do a gathering to raise awareness for something, things like that. So it really depends on your context and what, what can be done. And that oh, is right. safe, by the way, that is safe to, to those doing that. There's another interesting question. Uh... Where did the question go? Okay, so do you think uh, the dominance always make the minorities or the minorities are made by themselves? So Tema, that's a fantastic question. Yeah. Fantastic question. I love it. I love it. So um for this particular presentation in the book that I'm I'm talking about, I focus primarily on this um uh, great question. I, I focus on this relationship between dominant and minoritized but i i do talk about because i only presented to you right now two groups but i do talk in the book about four groups i just don't go too deep into it in the book but maybe that will be for future uh projects and future things but um there are in my perspective four groups so you have dominant groups and you have dominant group dominant individuals so are people in dominant groups who are dominant they're you know the top top and then you have in dominant groups individuals who are considered minorities or minoritized within that group and same same happens in the minoritized groups you have individuals who are considered more powerful in minoritized groups and individuals who are considered minoritized within the minoritized groups an example so um in the united states when i was in the united states i'm an immigrant english is not my native language I come from very, very poor backgrounds. I was, by all definitions, a minoritized uh, individual. In addition to that, in my society, in my minoritized group, which is the Hispanic group, Cubans, Latin Americans, Spanish-speaking people in the United States, we were all part of the same community. But I was, in the minoritized group, I was a minority within a minority. So I was a minoritized individual because of my sexual orientation, because of my religion, because of my different elements that made me a minoritized individual within the minoritized groups. So I would always be exposed to language from dominant groups who would minoritize me, but I was also exposed to um, my uh, from the minoritized community. I was always exposed to language who would also minoritize me within my minoritized group. So yes, uh, going back to your question, not only dominant groups can make minoritized individuals minorities or minorities in minoritized, but also within your own group. Uh, you know, if you're a minority, that same group can also make you minoritized as well. So absolutely. And it goes back to this, let me go very quickly here. It goes back to these elements. Oops, sorry. Okay, so even in minoritized groups, there's some um, some categories that will place you in a position of power or not. So thank you, thank, thank you for that question. Yeah, so so many intersectionalities, right? Yes, yes. Uh, the next question is: Is neutralizing language enough to do justice to separate individual 
recognition is mm -hmm. neutralizing language i wonder whether is it a possible process to like neutralize language in the very first place can we neutralize language thank you so much rushnam for that question you know here's the thing what is considered neutral a neutral neutral language right so that's something that we have to think about and i always struggle with this um, when I'm looking at, sorry about my dogs, they're in the background making noise. Um, I always, when I'm looking at, again, I analyze a lot of speeches, discourse, people when they speak, I'm, I'm always analyzing language. I love it. And I'm always thinking about this. What is considered neutral language? Because usually we use language with a purpose. We don't say something just to say it, you know, that there's always a reason behind it. So if we always have a purpose for using language, then can it really be considered neutral? So, uh, you know, in language itself, of course, it doesn't have emotion. So language is not a, a, a sentient being. It doesn't have any feelings or emotions, but people who use language, right? I don't know that people can use language in such a way. We always have a purpose for doing something, for saying something, for acting something. Because, you know, when we actual, actually also, when we uh, engage with people, body language, that also, that's, that's a form of language as well, right? So, everything that I see with language, visuals, this, that, all, everything that we see around us, there is a purpose behind it. So going back to your question, I don't think it's enough to, uh, you know, neutralizing language first. I don't know that there is such a thing. That might be, that might be uh, uh, something to look into for a future research paper or something. But, you know, I don't think there is such a thing as neutralizing la neutral language, because again, people use it with a purpose. But yeah. um, to do social justice or justice, you have to be... Uh, I, I think she's referring to politically correctness, like political PC. That's a neutralizing. Uh, mm. Yes, I don't, I don't see that either as a, as a neutral, uh, neutral terminology either. I, I think there is there is also this balance because I look at both sides, right? When we talk about political correctness, and I know that's a big thing now, right? Also, but when I, I'm, I'm analyzing that, there is an agenda behind it as well, how people use language and what, what is considered correct. Because for example, and this is something that I have seen, um, I'm going back to uh, Professor Hack's comments. Thank you so much. I was taking notes, Professor, when you were, ta were, were talking about uh, all of these points because it gave me a lot of uh, ideas. And so thank you for the inspiration. But, you know, um, when you were mentioning uh, geopolitical status and like, you know, the global society, I always find that countries, countries are also dominant or minoritized, by the way, right? Depending on language. But I always find that countries who are in dominant uh, positions, think of the US, which is perhaps because of the English and, and the money, economics, et cetera, they're in a very comfortable position of dominance power. Um, usually their issues, problems that are externalized through language to other countries. Situations that happen specifically in the United States through social media, et cetera, et cetera, are externalized, are sold to other countries that may not even be dealing with those same issues, but those countries and those people start adopting those problems. And everything happens through communication, through social media, because people in dominant, you know, this uh, dominant groups, dominant countries are externalizing that through language. So again, when I think of uh, political correctness, I think there is always an agenda from a global perspective, right? This idea of using language to externalize and uh, also solidify um, positions of power. So yeah, it's a difficult question, but I kind of went in circle here and hopefully I gave you a better overview. So it's hard to answer a yes or no kind of um, uh, response for that one. Great question, great question. All right. So we are kind of running by the time and we'll take only one more question that is from Professor uh, Shamshad Murtuza. That is, do you think oak has been weaponized particularly by the right against progress? The very thing by definition it is good for. Mm. Yes, I think, well, definitely. And this is something that I've, um, in the US, it's, it's, it's been very, very much used by politicians, which is very interesting to see. Um, but yes, yes, it definitely is being weaponized. And, and um, it's interesting to see how woke is now being connected to specific, we go back here to this um, category, um, hierarchy, you know, hierarchy and attributes. So if you're considered woke, you're considered, you know, uh, individual who is 
uh, in favor of gender equality or this or that. So it definitely is being targeted. We use that term, you know, the way that they're using it, it's being used by the right, by the left. And by the way, the left is also, I'm seeing that the left is claiming some of its power as well. So this is the idea, uh, going back to Professor Hack again, uh, he, what he was saying how minorities actually start using language to fight back as well. So they're reclaiming that term, but it's now it's becoming more connected to this idea of uh, equality in, in some way in the United States. But initially, yes, absolutely, it was, and it still continues to be very weaponized to say, oh, you're one of these people who wants like, you know, equality for everyone or something like that. But that was considered bad, right? Because you were called that. If you're called woke, then there is something wrong with you because you're not the norm. And that's that's exactly the process of language weaponization. You're stigmatizing, you're othering, you're dehumanizing because then you're not considered the norm. You're less than human or you're someone who thinks something different or some uh, religious uh, individuals, politicians in the U.S., you know, you're sinful, you're against God, you're this, you're that. And they start using this type of language to make people less than human and then eventually cause harm in the form of taking the rights, et cetera, et cetera. So absolutely, 100%. All right. Uh, there are two more questions, but I would like to take only one because uh, uh, I think it's interesting and it also refers back to Professor Hobbes. Uh, comment. Do you think positive language weaponization is necessary for the society or can it be corrupted in position of power as well? Mm, great question. So <laughs> this is I love this question too. Okay, so here's the thing. I've been looking at this because I, I do present language weaponization from a more negative harm perspective, which is, you know, what I have been presenting, Professor Hawk made reference to this on how minority, minoritized dominant groups, so this idea of this collision, harm, and I've been thinking about that, you know, can you use language, it wouldn't be weaponized because weapon is already bad, right, so can you use language to, like, the opposite, right, to make it something positive, and, um, I mean, we, we see, I, I'm analyzing some countries that seem to have a good balance of democracy, but I've also seen how language has been used to kind of fight language weaponization, but unfortunately, I do see how it goes too far. And then when this language, I saw it in Cuba, for example, in the example that I gave you in Cuba, where there was a lot of... Um, issues happening in society before Fidel Castro, for example, but then Fidel Castro and those, uh, you know, the, the during the Cuban revolution, I don't know if you're familiar with that, 1959, uh, Fidel Castro took over and then he started using language to supposedly fight against the injustices and language weaponization that was happening in society due to race, et cetera, et cetera. But then it went too far to the point that then language was used against those people who were not in favor of the politics and the, the the situations that was happening in Cuba to the point that today, for example, 2023, people cannot actually share their perspectives. So language now is used against them. So it, it looks like, and this is something that I have seen of how minoritized groups just are using language to fight back language weaponization. And sometimes they keep it in a balance. Some countries you see this perspective of democracy, but I have seen also how minoritized groups utilize language to fight back, but then they become in the process dominant groups and then they make dominant groups, they make them minoritized and then they start using the same concept of language weaponization, just going in circle and they, they end up in the same in the same point. So it's, it's very complex, very interesting. I'm seeing that too. So maybe that's something uh, to write about in the future, but yes, absolutely. It's, it's, um, it's it's never a black and white. There's always a, a, a process. But yes, I have seen how people use language to fight against language weaponization, but sometimes they end up in the same the same uh, uh, point that they started, unfortunately. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I'm not taking any more questions. But so Rafi, I, I think the empathy question is very important. Like, you know, so yeah. Dr. Javier, if you'd like to respond. Yes, yes. Which one oh. is it? Em about empathy? Do you think having empathy for all the people will solve the discrimination? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, thank you so much for that question. Thank you. That's a positive note uh, to end on a positive note. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Language is transformative. And I, I, I'm going to, to share what I started with. I always see language. People think of power as money, this, that. I see in our global society, language as the, the most powerful attribute in the world. 
uh, because we're social creatures. We we use language to communicate in every single way. And um, again, language is not only speaking, different forms of languages, um, text, visuals, body, uh, body language, et cetera, et cetera. So in the same way that it can be used to create harm and to create um, this idea of minoritize, minoritizing individuals, which when you minoritize individuals, it creates a sense of self-doubt, you know, identity. I talk about I talked about that earlier, identity issues. You can also yeah. use language to empower and to create social change. So language can be used for good or for bad. It depends how you use it. And um is is the most important thing to to think about. How can we use language every day for ourselves, for our communities? But it starts with ourselves, right? So how am I using language? to empower myself, to, to create social change, starting from myself. You know, if in societies people refer to me as something, how am I using language to refer to myself, to start changing the perspectives of how I look at myself? And then that's how you can start using language every day. Really, when you start thinking about the language that you use, you start analyzing the vocabulary that you use every day to refer to yourself, to others, you start yeah. noticing changes and which words you want to adopt and why you want to say this and not that. And it becomes transformative, it really does. So thank you so much for that question. All right, uh, thank you so much. Thanks to our students as well as to Luis for such a lively Q&A session. Now I'd like to invite Professor Shamshad Mokhtuza to provide final remarks. So Dr. Herrera, thank you so much. That was so refreshing and enlightening. Uh, we talk about weaponization of language, you know, so President Trump talked about weaponization of COVID, you know, so suddenly like, you know, we have been using language as tools, like, you know, forever, like, you know, starting with all the epics. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear all right. you. Sorry. Yes, 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 I stopped sharing so we could see each other. All right, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. So, uh, so suddenly, like you know, so this word has become uh, a fad, like you know, in the nineteen sixties, right? So the evolution of uh, the word, as well as the change of a noun into a verb, that itself suggests, like you know, so how power and knowledge, you know, so can build uh, a nexus that Foucault has uh, reminded us repeatedly, and you have taken us back to that power knowledge nexus. And thank you for sharing that personal uh, anecdote. So um, uh, it takes a lot of courage to, you know, uh, confide uh, with strangers. But uh, you have done that, and you have shown humility, and that is a huge takeaway for our students. You know, I'm so glad that uh, uh, you're sharing your knowledge. But at the same time, so the, with the humility, uh, you have approached the topic. So that could be a learning lesson for. Uh, many of us here. And especially like, you know, you talked about this double marginalization, double racialization. Uh, many of our students, so because we belong to a community where we have say 90%, you know, uh, Muslim Bangladeshis, right? So the racial issues, uh, probably like, you know, we have read about it, you know, so we have uh, talked about it. But it does not always like you know so uh, strike a raw nerve in us, you know. So uh, when Kaiser was talking about Caliban, like you know, with reference to uh, Shakespeare's Tempest, that the prophet on learning a language is that you know we can curse against the colonizer. Uh, that is basically the position that we take in the English department, so especially uh, in the in the literature program. And I was thinking of the passive resistance, like, you know, because I studied American Indians um, and the sound of silence, you know, so maybe silence as a weapon, you know, so because we mostly talked about dehumanization, but uh, uh, there are the other nonverbal components of language, because uh, when we talk about uh, or think about uh, the Masa Amini, you know, uh, situation in Iran, so the haircutting episodes, you know, so the protest that, you know, Professor Kaiser Hawk referred to, you know, so that is a different kind of weapons, you know, so maybe crude, maybe lethal, maybe homemade, you know, that is a different types of weapon. So it's very difficult to generalize this topic because uh, language is both local and universal. It has a local tone and at the same time, like, you know, universal um, connotations and nuances. 
and the us and them binary is always there and uh, whoever has power like you know so defines the norm and you mentioned the uh, normative and the non normative categories it's very important that our student internalizes those and i'm really really thankful to our students like you know they came up with brilliant questions so like you know you have made us so proud so i'm admitting this before our guest but uh, you know so I, as a teacher I'm really, really proud, like, you know, so by the uh, intellectual maturity. So you're all undergrad students, but uh, the level of uh, maturity that you've shown and demonstrated. So I really appreciate that. And Dr. Rafi, so thank you for introducing your friend to us. Uh, now we have another friend and I'm sure like, you know, so we'll have uh, many such uh, conversations in the future where we will learn from one another. So Dr. Herrera, it's a real pleasure and honor to have you online. Uh, at ULAB and I hope says someday like you know you'll have an opportunity to come and visit us and I'm sure like you know your Marine Corps experience that you know Rafi mentioned earlier so you're the right person to um, you know talk about these issues and I uh, have actually gone through this special volume that you have edited and I look forward to the book uh, in which Rafi has a chapter so uh, again um, uh, it's my heartfelt gratitude for your time and for your contribution to our curriculum integration program. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you me. very much, Professor Shamsad Mortuza, sir, for your engaging and thought-provoking closing remarks. After all these interesting exchanges, it may sound a bit mundane, but it's important to acknowledge everyone who has contributed to the success of this program. So firstly, I would like to thank again, Professor Luis Javier Penton Herrera for accepting my invitation to speak at the forum. We are incredibly honored to hear from you as you are one of the leading scholars who are advancing the study of language weaponization. I would also like to appreciate Professor Kaiser Hamidul Haq, Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities for delivering the welcome address, although uh, after your speech uh, for the technical glitches and as well as Professor Shamsud Mortuza, sir, the special advisor for delivering an excellent closing remark. I would also like to salute Department Head Arifa Rahman, who is absent due to a prior commitment, but without whose assistance I couldn't have organized this program. Additionally, I would like to thank our office assistant, Leah, the teaching assistants, Iriti and Noor, for preparing and distributing promotional materials and the IT support is Tiagvai for the program's seamless broadcast. Last but not least, I'd like to thank all faculty members and students who attended and contributed to the success of the program. So before we conclude today's forum, I would want to invite you to the second forum of the curriculum integration program, which is scheduled for 16th October 2023. Professor Shamsad Mortuza sir will join us as the forum speaker and deliver a lecture on language weaponization in literature and cultural studies. So goodbye until then, have a good rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Have a wonderful night. Thank you so much, Professor Herbera. So- A pleasure. Yeah, hope to, all right then, hope to be in touch. Take care everyone. Thank you. Bye. We'll be in touch. Bye. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Bye. Sure, bye-bye. Sir, meeting close for a